Uh, good morning and welcome to our June 18th uh, oral argument. We have one case today, um, O'Halloran versus Secretary of State and Director of the Bureau of Elections. This is a 15 minute mini oral argument on the application. You may reserve um, time for rebuttal, but we ask that you keep track of that if we don't use up all of your time. Um, and we are going to start um, with Miss my guest. If you could turn on your computer, your uh, video and your audio. Do you see me and hear me now? <laughs> Welcome. Okay. Uh, good morning, Your Honors. Heather Meingas on behalf of Secretary Benson and Director of Elections. I'd like to reserve two minutes for rebuttal if that's possible. Election challengers have long played an important role in ensuring the integrity of Michigan's elections. And the legislature has prescribed for their rights and duties by statute but also expressly mandated that the secretary issue specific instructions, not rules, for procedures and forms for processing challenges. Here, the Court of Claims erred in, in two ways. First, in determining that the form and instructions conflicted with the election law, the court applied a cramped and conflicting analysis of the underlying statutes and a narrow view of what the secretary can issue as a procedural instruction, essentially limiting her to issuing instructions that parrot statutory text. Second, to the extent that the court suggested or concluded that the form and the instructions had to be promulgated as rules, the court failed to recognize the secretary's express and specific authority to provide for forms and instructions related to the challenge process outside of rulemaking. Instead, a careful review of the statutes reveals that these instructions do not conflict with the plain text nor legislative intent, and they were neither arbitrary nor capricious. Further, the form and instructions did not need to be promulgated as rules where the legislature has expressly authorized the secretary to regulate in this area outside of rulemaking. This express provision to act outside of rulemaking recognizes the unique circumstances of election administration. Here, the lower court's errors are now codified in the Court of Appeals' published opinion, the binding analysis of which threatens the secretary's ability to issue timely and effective instructions going forward. We therefore ask that this court grant leave and reverse. Thank you. Um, at this time, I'm going to take questions um, from the bench. Um, okay. I, I will. I will start. Um, I just have a um, one question for you. Um, so, if we agree that the manual is an exercise of permissive authority and and not a rule subject to the rulemaking process, do, do you think that this essentially gives the Secretary of State carte blanche to issue? whatever instructions the office desires without having to engage in rulemaking? So, so if the, the the challenger manual that we're speaking of today, the instructions today, um, I think there is an argument that, that we have under section 311A that the secretary has the authority to issue instructions in the nature of rules. That's That's kind of the big argument, right? But what the court needs to decide today or the smaller issue that we're looking at today specifically is, is what is the authority under Section 311C, um, you know, the specific authority to issue instructions, procedural instructions related to the challenge process, right? So, uh, you know, and, and our argument is, of course, that we fall within procedural instructions and rules aren't even implicated here because we're well within the specific authority given to the secretary in the specific statute in the election law. And so, you know, we don't need to have this bigger issue or bigger discussion or the scope of what the issue instructions and promulgate rule language means in, in 31A. Okay, thank you. Justice Barrow? Well, following, on that, uh, following up on that, um, the plaintiffs claim that there's an actual violation of law with respect to recording of challenges, and they point to section 727. And I note in your re your reply brief, you say, well, while it says that in 727, uh, two, th th they don't offer any reason why it should be imported into sub subsection 733, which allows you to make instructions and rules. But when we're, when we're looking at express language of a statute that says everything should be recorded, why shouldn't we conclude that that is a rule rather than an instruction? And help me understand what the difference is between a rule and a, an instruction. Clearly, the legislature identified both, but it would seem to me that a rule would be something stronger than an instruction. And when we're talking about 
hey, I believe I've got the authority to 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 not record everything when it expressly says in section 7272 that I am supposed to record everything. Thank you, Your Honor. So, right, let's go to the language of section 727. It's really important here to understand uh, the differences between section 727 and 733, right? So 727 imposes a recording requirement only on only for challenges made under 727.1, right? So we're talking about only two subsets, two types of challenges where the legislature has actually said, we want this process to be followed. We want this recording process. If you look over in 733, which is the credential challenger, essentially where you find most of the credential challenger authority, this, the legislature has not did not import the process over from 727.2, right? It has not provided any sort of um, textual requirement um, for following the recording um, you know, um, provisions over in 727. It sort of left the space within the secretary's authority to issue procedural instructions for. So it's important to look at what kind of challenges we're talking about and who's making them as far as whether there's a specific requirement that applies. And so in 733, where there's no recording requirement, um, there's no specifics as to who challengers, you know, should direct challenges to or their communications to, the secretary's authority to issue specific procedural instructions for this process is what gives her the authority to issue this specific instruction related to sort of the permissible and impermissible challenge that we have here. Can you give me an example of something that would be done that would be a rule and not an instruction? So I think from the way we've looked at it, a rule would be something where we do not have sort of a sufficient like statutory tether um, to make or to give the instruction that we would like, right? There isn't sort of a sufficiently strong jumping out point from the actual textual language. And I can think of one example, not, not on challengers, but we, we recently did a rule set for, um, this court should be familiar with, with affidavits of identity, right? And so in that rule set, so what we wanted to do with respect to affidavits of identity was to require candidates to, to, to disclose in which counties they had run for office because this information will assist us in determining whether people's campaign finance statements are up to date, right? But, but the, the statute 558 didn't give us the authority to ask for that information, right? And so we promulgated this part of the rule promulgation process. We put that in our rule. Like we are now requiring that candidates disclose this information um, because it's, it is a logical sort of construction that flows from the duties that we have there. But there wasn't really necessarily a specific textual source, you know, for that instruction. All right. One, one more question then. Sure. But that does not then Section 733 require everything the secretary to be done to be tethered in some way to the text of the statute giving authority? Yes, I would agree that for all the instructions concerning credential challengers in 733, that we have to have a specific textual source, which which we do here. But you, when just when distinguishing between a rule and an instruction, you said a rule would be something where there's less of there, there's there's not a textual basis for it. Well, in this and I say everything in seven thirty three requires a textual basis. That's my question. Do you disagree with that? Well, we have to look at 733 and what the, what what do we see there, right? And you have to and we read it together with our power under 731.1c, right? So we have a specific authority to provide instructions for the challenge process, right? In 733, the legislature has sort of outlined you know the rights and duties of challengers and given us guidance. There's guidance in there um, for what they can and can't do, right? And the at the same time, we have the authority to make the procedural, the, the legislature specifically mandated specific instructions for this process. And so that's what we've done. And the grounds for the instructions really do, you know, depending on which one you're talking about, right? You know, permissible challenges, liaison, all of that. There's a textual source that we can use as a hook for the instruction. Yeah, I'll pass on to the rest of my colleagues. Thank you. Justice Viviano. I have no questions at this time. Thank you. Justice Bernstein. 
Nothing at this time. <clears throat> uh, Justice Kavanaugh. I don't have any questions. Justice Welch. Uh, yeah, so um, I'm just wondering, um, 24.207H, which is uh, one of the exceptions for rules as to uh, instructions. And obviously there's an argument um, that the uh, credentialing form here is a, um, or credentialing uh, card uh, mm -hmm. is a form. I'm like, can you give examples of other forms that the secretary has issued using this particular section? Sure. So, um, Going back to affidavits of identity, um, and that is in section 168.558. So that statute clearly requires candidates to file an affidavit of identity, right? But nowhere in that statute does it um, prescribe, you know, who creates the form for that, right? Um, so using our source of authority in section 311E, which is to prescribe and require uniform forms for the conducting of elections, the secretary used that authority to actually create and require the affidavit of identity form that candidates all now use, you know, fill out and file with their filing official. So that's an example of the use of that statute in the election context. And, and to be clear, your position is that um, the items that are going to be on uh, that credentialing credential, <laughs> the <laughs> items that are going to be on there um, are just what's in the statute and not anything substantively changing the statute. Right. So the, the the plaintiff's argument is that by requiring, prescribing a form and requiring it, we've added a substantive component to section 732. But what 732 simply requires is that there be a written authority and that it include, you know, specific con you know, content prescribes some content. Nowhere in that statute does it, um, you know, prescribe who designs the form or who is responsible for what the form should look like. And so just like the affidavit identity statute, and given our specific source of authority in 311C to provide for forms related to the challenge process, and the broader authority in section 311E to prescribe, you know, forms uh, as she deems advisable, that gives us the authority to, to require this form, and it doesn't conflict with any statutory language in 732 as far as uh, who prescribes the form. And, you know, form making or this authority, I mean, agencies making forms is a pretty routine matter, and that's that's why it's exempt from rulemaking for the most part, right? So this is an innocuous instruction that the plaintiffs haven't really described how this harms their interests in any way. And the divisor plaintiffs have even conceded that we can regulate content. So we could preclude, you know, the, the inclusion of party logos or other extraneous information on the form itself. So if we can do that, it's hard to understand why we also don't have the similar authority to provide for the form of the credential card. Okay. I, I want to turn to um, just the sort of um, uh, power to eject folks from polling places. Um, it, is it your position, are you, you know, there's lots of, uh, the manual has sort of um, guidance about uh, when people should be ejected. Is it your position that that conduct is disorderly conduct or is it something beyond, something different than disorderly conduct or maybe it doesn't matter? Right, so the textual source for the instruction regarding when a challenger might be expelled it is that disorderly conduct, right? That's, um, I think that's over in 733. And so the courts, you know, the lower courts it's essentially agreed that disorderly conduct related to challenger behavior could be grounds for expulsion, right? So so we, we agree with that. So that's a favorable decision. Now, what they then said was, well, it couldn't be based on this concept of the impermissible challenges, Although the court of claims, so the court of claims uses use the word like unfounded challenges. Uh, to us, that's that's the same thing, but we're cognizant that um, you know they disagreed with the ability to sort of distinguish permissible and impermissible challenges. But foundationally, if if we're right, you know the court of claims and the court of appeals have already agreed that there is a basis for expelling challengers, um, you know, for misbehavior or disorderly conduct. In, in the context of the challenge process it's, itself. And, you know, and I would note that, you know, obviously expulsion is is a last resort. It certainly doesn't happen very often. Um, the instructions is to give warnings and to try to correct behavior um, before we ever reach the expulsion part. 
Thank you. How do we know it doesn't happen very often? Just what? I'm sorry. One second. We um gonna check with Justice Bolden first. Yeah, I'm sorry. Justice Bolden. No questions. Thank you. Go, uh, go ahead, Justice Zara. So, how, how do we know ejection doesn't happen very often? Um, typically on election day and those types of issues, the bureau would receive word um, that something like that has happened um, frequently. If that's coming to a head, clerks will call. Um, the clerks will know um, because actually there is an appeal. So if a challenger but, is expelled by an inspector, right, that can but be- But we really don't know under these rules how often it'll happen because the argument is that this really has changed the groundwork. I, I don't, th this, this instruction for expelling persons for misbehavior in the challenge process, that's, this is not a new thing really, right? Um, this has been going on. Um, the, the concept of what's permissible as a challenge, that this is not new. It's new that we actually wrote it down and carefully explained it, right? But, you know, the Bureau is generally aware of what happens and receives reports and expulsions are, are, are rare. So it's a rule put in place where it's rarely used anyhow. It's an instruction that we have that doesn't arise very often, right? Because okay. it's a last resort remedy. And, and getting back to the credential card, Mm -hmm. um, am I correct that that credential card must be obtained before election day? You have to, right. I mean, challengers have to show, so if we're talking about the parties, right, or, or actually anybody, right, if you show up at the door of the polling place, right, you need to have your credential card ready with you. But in, in the past, if you showed up at the card, at the polling place with a document that the uh, was authorized by the recognized chairman of the officer on the day of the election, you were permitted to be a challenger. Right, which is still what the credential form is, you know, under our instruction, right? It's still all you need is is the signature of your presiding officer, but but on our form. But, but, yes, but it, must, previous... it must be obtained before election day, right? Yes, that's, that's not different. Well, why do you say it's not different? Because... You've always had to come to the polling places with your card, with your credential. You came to the polling place with a letter signed by or authorization by the party chair, which, I, you know, 30 years ago, I was a poll challenger. You'd get it on election day itself, but now you can't get it on election day. Both parties are scrambling to find people who are willing to go out and be challengers. And now this rule or this instruction, I'll, I'll go with you. It's an instruction. says you can't do that on election day. You have to do it before. Isn't that something that's new? I don't, I'm not sure, I, I don't believe that's correct, Your Honor. I'm not sure where it says that somehow you you can get it, you just need to have it when you enter the polling place, right? Whether you get it outside or you get it five minutes before you walk in or you get it two days in advance. You're, but, but if, you, if, you got, if you got written authorization right. from the party chair, but it's not this credential card, and you walk in on election day and say, I'm a poll challenger, what will happen? Well, right. If you don't use the form, the instruction to clerks is that that and to the inspectors is, is that this person should not be admitted as a challenger because they're not using the prescribed form. Are the forms but, available but, on election day to to anyone who wants them? Well, the forms are available online. So the anticipation is that the challenging organizations have completed all of these, you know, downloaded the cards and got them all completed so that when you show up on election day, you're all set with your little credential card. It's a, it's and, the forms. And that's, it. and that's no different than it's always been, correct? No, I don't think that the, there's nothing different about the timing of when you need to have your, your credential, right? You always need to have it before you, you walk in, you know, to the polling place so that you can show it that you're a credential challenger and I'm allowed to be here, right? So there's, there's nothing different, different with respect to timing. And actually, if you look at the instructions, you know, if you don't want to use the card, the instructions specifically provide that that the organizations can, you know, create a digital, a digital form, a digital card for use on a, a on a cell phone. So that's even easier. It still okay. should have the kind, you know, be limited to the content that the instructions provide for. Okay, I guess I'm getting taught. Uh, uh, uh stuck on the if the entire form is not completed, they can be precluded from being a challenger. But that would always be true. If you didn't have the signature on there, then you wouldn't be admitted, right? But if, if all it is, is that, is that is that what all the form requires is the signature of your county chair? It All the form requires, the content-wise, is what 732 requires. All right.
Any, any other follow-up questions? Yeah, I suppose I have one about permissible and impermissible challenges. There's, there's councils, I read the statute, um, section uh, 727, uh, subsection two makes it clear that any challenge under subsection one must be recorded. Where does the secretary find the authority to determine, to have clerks determine which challenges are permissible such that they don't even have to be adjudicated, much less recorded for future review by anybody? In, in other words, to act as sort of the judge, jury, and executioner on whatever is designated as quote unquote impermissible challenges. Right. So looking at 727, right? So the recording, all of 722, right? The recording requirement, the process, all of those things is premised upon a challenge being made under subsection one, right? So how do you make a challenge? Like what are the parameters of making a challenge. So essentially the permissible and in challenge instruction here is what we are requiring or what the instruction requires is that challengers be able to make sort of like a, a facially valid challenge, right? In order to, to proceed to the recording, like the processing steps. And so what's, what's a facially valid challenge? Well, we know what the challenger in this case, let's say it's the registered elector, so the voter on voter challenges provided in 727, is that you know the registered election, the, the, the challenger, the registered elector, has to know or has a good reason to suspect that an individual is not a registered elector in that precinct, right? That so, doesn't sound like a black and white issue to me, no or good reason to suspect. In other words, it seems to me that there are arguments could be made on that, and the the problem I'm having is, um, what if a clerk or a, a, a you know a volunteer somebody makes uh, an error on whether something is facially valid? Under your system, that just goes into the ether. There's no record of it. There's no because it doesn't have to be recorded. Well, I, I'm sorry. You can I just you know in the court system we don't operate like that, right? We we file everything. Everything's on the docket. Everybody, whether it's facially valid or not, you know, the, the ruling is, is it's transparent. You know, I would think that you would want in a system where under, under circumstances where every election is being challenged and every procedure is being challenged, you would want to be as transparent as possible. Having a preliminary step where you get to excuse yourself from the entire statutory process would raise some red flags, would it not? Um, I, I don't think so, Your Honor. And, and sort of just going back to the legal analogy, I, I mean, the court doesn't always take something, right? I, I mean, pleadings can be rejected if they're not in the proper form, right? That That's essentially sort of the analogy here. And, and all we're... I, I, I mean, I, don't, I guess in the, in the federal <laughs> system that used to happen, but I'm not aware of that happening in the state court system uh, with oh, court filings. <laughs> the clerks typically will receive it, and then the court will decide what to do with it later it could be somehow invalidated i suppose but I, where does the secretary derive it'll you know, derive this power to, to, to determine make a preliminary determination on whether something's permissible or not such that it there'll be no record of it it's very sort of kafka-esque you can you know the, the concern would be of course the power to make a challenge disappear right and there'd be no record of it well you know, the instructions, so even for an, in what we would, what the instructions deem an impermissible challenge, the direction is that, clerk, that the clerks or the, the liaisons, right, essentially in the in the places should still record this in a, a less full manner, right? So if they have the time and the ability to record an impermissible challenge, the direction is that they do that. That wouldn't go full, through like sort of the full process. That would be a notation, I believe, um, in the paper poll book. That, that as I read the manual, it does it basically encourages you if you're busy, yes. to just forget about it. Right. But if you have a hundred people online, you have time and you got nothing else to do, you might want to make a note about it. That that's not really if it's slow, if, right? If you read that provision, it does everything to encourage people to say, if you think it's impermissible, just forget about it. Right. Well, I I don't agree with that, Your Honor. And and going back to the authority, what we're we're simply requiring that challengers to be able to articulate 
is what 727 requires. It's not an insurmountable you know, hurdle, right? The elector, the voter has to, you know, articulate, you know, that they know or have good reason to suspect that someone's not registered. We know what registration means, right? There's only there's only specific. Wait, wait, so they so they just have to allege that they know or have good reason to suspect, or they have to prove it at the preliminary stage. You have because to allege you're, you're, the statute you're requires what, whether it's permissible or not is making a basically substantive legal judgment before even receiving the challenge, right? No, you just have to make the challenger or the here the registered elector under seven twenty seven one has to be able to art you know, make a facial a challenge that meets the requirements of subsection. So they have a proof. You have a proof requirement, is what you're telling me, which is even it's more than it's, it's not. not a proof it's not. A, it's not. It doesn't sound like a pleading requirement. You just said they have to make a showing. That's a proof requirement. I don't know that it's 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 proof. You have to be art. You have to articulate good cause, right? You have to have, or excuse me, good a good reason. A challenger has to articulate a good reason why they know or suspect that the person they wish to challenge is not registered. If you can't articulate good cause, if you if the you go to the challenger and you say, I challenge Mr. Smith, and that's all you've done, that's all you articulate. I challenge Mr. Smith. I don't think he's registered in this precinct. That that is not a challenge. That is not a proper challenge under 727-1. You have not expressed, you have not made into an effort to express the grounds for your challenge. You have to be able to demonstrate or you have to articulate at least, and you could be wrong. You can be wrong, right? And that's okay. But you have to be able to articulate your the grounds for your challenge. What is your good cause? What prong of registration are, are you challenging? What do you know or why do you suspect that Mr. Smith is not registered in the precinct, right? Can I, can I follow up on that? And I think, so I understand your <laughs> argument that if um, in order to sort of trigger the recording requirement under subsection two, it has to be a challenge under subsection one. So the requirement or the instruction that the challenge has to be, uh, has to specify one of the four permissible reasons, right? and has to give, provide a reason, right? That they know or suspect. Is there, is there daylight? Because the, the instruction then goes arguably further in saying that it's it's impermissible if the reason provided bears no relation to those criteria, or if the reason is obviously inapplicable or incorrect. Is that, is that, the, that second part no bears no reason or obviously in, uh, inapplicable or incorrect is that are you saying that that's basically synonymous with the nose or has reason to know or is that basically requiring the election inspector to make a um a merits determination so to what justice viviano is saying or are you saying that that requirement is basically synonymous with that they know or have reason to know that requirement, so the liaison, right, who will be handling the challenge, when they're receiving the challenge, you know, they do have the ability, you would still have the ability to, to determine whether that's an actionable sort of challenge. If I say something crazy, uh, well, for, for example, if I, my challenge is I challenged Mr. Smith, um, I don't think he's registered um, because he doesn't speak English very well, right? That's obviously not a ground, that's not a ground to challenge registration on because being able to speak English well is not a requirement for registration. So if, if the challenger articulates something that makes no sense, I mean, is, is far afield from any of the prongs for registration, the clerk can take note, right? We don't have to accept a challenge that's that's outside of, of the parameters or is is based on something that's simply simply wrong. If that helps, it does. But that that determination of what that it's wrong is is given to the inspector. Say the challenge says, "I don't think they're they're um, eligible to vote in this precinct because I think they live somewhere else." I mean, can the can the challenger liaison say, 
I think that that's incorrect and not record it. That one should get over it, but you have to say, I think this register, you know, something like that would be, I'm challenging Mr. Smith um, as being unregistered in our jurisdiction because I know that he moved 12 months ago to Detroit, right? So there has to be a little extra um, explanation of, of why you don't think the persons are registered in the district. You can't just say, Mr. Smith, I challenge Mr. Smith because I don't think he's registered in this district, right? I don't think he's registered for, for uh, uh, what is your, what is the basis of your, of your no or suspicion that he's not registered, you know, because um, he's my next door neighbor and I know that he moved 12 months ago, right? And, and, so and the clear, and, the, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I was gonna say, and to be clear, like that section, it actually, the challenger has to be a registered elector in that precinct or in that voting yes, district, correct? Yes, that's right. We're in the 727 window because in 733 for credential challengers, there, there's no recording requirement you know, at all over, over there. So what we've done over there is borrow the language from 727-2 to apply that to credential challenger challenges. So if we're in the 727 box, right, we're talking about a registered elector in the precinct. I would call these, you know, the traditional neighbor on neighbor challenges. And, and this is what the law has long provided. The authority of, of credential challengers to challenge voter eligibility is still a fairly recent vintage, right? That that was only permitted in like 1995. So it's it's not a traditional challenge for credential challengers. And so to be clear, it, it, your position is that does not carry over to the counting boards, the recording requirement. Well, at, at the absent voter counting boards, the only challenge you can make at an absent voter counting board is a challenge, is a sorry, is a, a procedural challenge, right? Under 733-1D. So at absent voter counting boards, you can only make procedural challenges. And, and both courts below recognized that there was no recording requirement at all for procedural challenges. But then they failed to appreciate that 733-1, you know, doesn't have a recording requirement for credential voter eligibility challenges either. Okay, so, thank you. Any final questions? Um, let me just briefly touch on the challenger liaison. As I understood it, your, your position is that the difference between an instruction and a rule is uh, an instruction has some textual basis to it and a rule doesn't. Is that, am I oversimplifying your position? Maybe a little. I, I think a rule would still have to have a textual basis but there might be sort of a, a, a larger leap or a, more of a gap between the textual source and what we want to accomplish as a result. And, and, and I guess it's up to us to decide how big that that leap is. Um, well, you know, our position is that that none of these instructions are rules, right? Because they all emanate out of oh, statutory okay. language. But but, but, you know, so, but but we're here because there's a question about whether the rules are in, or instructions. So it's it's for us to decide how big of a leap. Essentially, well, the, is what you're telling me. The first question is is, is whether the, the instructions conflict with the election law, which is 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 you know the first principal question. And then if we get past that, then the court's going to have to decide you know the promulgation versus instruction issue. Well, where's the textual basis for the challenger liaison? Is it anywhere in the Michigan election law? Is there anything that requires yes. election challengers to speak with a designated? challenger only? Well, again, so if, if we're looking at 727 challenges and 733 challenges, again, with respect to credential challenger challenges under 733, that that section is silent as to whom a challenge should be made, right? So in that space, again, you know, the legislature has granted the secretary, you know, required the secretary to issue specific procedural instructions for for managing the challenge process so if there's not if, if it, there's not a limitation or there's not a prescription on to whom a challenger must direct a challenge under 733 in that you know it must go to somebody and it makes logical sense that it goes to an election inspector we were free in that space to and we're, we're free over in 727 as well but we're certainly free in the 733 context to designate which inspector where the legislature has not specified, right, has not really, you know, gone into that space. 
But the legislature said an election inspector, not the designated election inspector. In 733, you would be talking about Section 311E, which are non-challenged communications, right? So those are communications other than challenges. And our instruction is that even non-challenged communications under 311E should be directed to the liaison as well. And so our, you know, construction of the and, right, an indefinite article, and looking at this court's um, words in, in prior case law is that, you know, whether an A or an AN um, can mean a discrete thing is, is really based on context. So our context here is that, and this is principally based, so there's a lot of argument over in 727, but in 733, AN inspector is, is a discrete inspector, right? You may bring it to the attention of, of A or AN inspector. And we're, in, if it's just the one, and this makes you know sense, you know, the practical reason why we have the liaison, right, is to have all challenges, all problems brought to before one person so that we can ensure consistent resolutions and that challengers are sort of not attempting to shop around, you know, for, for different answers. We need one person to resolve challenges and there should be one person to whom sort of other complaints or concerns are directed to so that there is consistent a consistent resolution of these concerns for for every every challenger and every process point that comes up, you know, in a precinct or at an absent voter counting board. But, but does not the statute call for an appointment of election election inspectors from each party and to try to make them as equal as possible? So when you pick yes. one, who gets to decide which one from which party? What what, what? well, but we're also taking into consideration, right? So for polling places, what one inspector is is appointed the chair, right? And the chair is generally the person who runs the precinct. And it has generally been, uh, it has also generally been true that one person resolves challenges. It can't be that two people resolve challenges, right? It needs to be one person resolving challenges so that there is continuity. So when the legislature has said that there shall be a chair of a precinct, right? That's a natural, selection of, of who who is to receive a challenge or a communication. I mean, we're taking, you know, our argument is based on, on the context and what Anne might mean. But, but the legislature doesn't say shall take it to the chair. It says shall take it to any election, to an election inspector, not an election inspector identified as the chair or identified as a challenger liaison. That, that's that's correct. It doesn't expressly say that. It's we have we have different war, warring constructions, right, of what the word "and" uh, might mean in thirty one one e. Um, you know, it, it could be, you know, in the context of, of, of that one that, you know, "and" might mean something different over in the seven twenty seven than it does over here. Um, you know, and if we were wrong, we're only wrong on who the instruction is only incorrect as to who non-challenged communications um, may be directed to. So we're still correct uh, on, on limiting limiting the direction of challenges, right? Because there's space and there's no prohibition or there's no an inspector you know, requirement in that sense. So, uh, you know, the Court of Appeals and the Court of Claims, again, you know, failed to appreciate a lot of these distinctions in the election law and, and lumped a lot of stuff together. Thank you. Can I just go back to for a minute to the impermissible challenges? I just want to make sure I understand your um, position. I'm looking at the manual and it gives improper reasons for challenges and it gives proper reasons for challenges. Um, as I understand it, though, just saying, for example, a proper reason would be a person's not registered to vote. But if the challenger just says that, that that would not be a permissible challenge. Is that right? If, if if all the challenger said is, I challenge Mr. Smith, I don't think he's registered to vote. You haven't articulated your good cause, your good, your good reason, your your knowledge or your good reason to suspect that Mr. Smith is not registered in your precinct. Right. We still you need to articulate a ground for why you believe that, why you know that, or why you yeah, I, I understand that. That's a that's called a standard of proof, right? You have to provide proof i mean it, as i look down you to, have your, to articulate to your, challenge you could no be wrong on proof you don't have to be right 
Right. You no would explanation, be no explanation for a challenge. Um, if 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 the explanation or if a not a sufficient explanation is not given, then that's an impermissible challenge, right? If the challenger has not articulated their knowledge or the why they have good reason to suspect that the person is not registered in that precinct, then they haven't made a challenge. That that is exactly what 727 one requires, right? Because the other other sections, because I, you can't. A I'm trying to figure out what's left for the adjudication. So if the preliminary showing is made, is the challenge then sustained? Yes, it's not sustained, right? You go you go through the process then. If you get if you clear the threshold, I've made a facially. I believe Mr. S I know or I suspect Mr. Smith's not registered in my jurisdiction in this precinct because I know he moved 12 months ago to Detroit. Right. That that is going to if you say I know that that clears your you've made a facially you've made a facial challenge. Right. And then we go to the recording process and you could be wrong. Right. And, and wrong challenges are still recorded. Right. In other words, your challenge may not be sustained after that point because the clerk goes and they pull aside Mr. Smith and then they, you know, they look in the QVF and, oh, by golly, he's he's still registered here in this precinct. Um, so we don't sustain your challenge, but it's all written down. What I'm trying to understand is how much room for discretion is there in evaluating the sufficiency of the explanation at this preliminary stage? There's some. There's some. Right. I mean, but election inspectors and the liaisons, everybody's trained as to how, you know, how challenges, everybody receives training, right, before before performing their duties on election day. All inspectors are trained, right? So they're going to be trained in this challenge process. And there's always going to be a, a small amount of discretion, you know, for the liaison to determine whether you've crossed that, that sort of that, that threshold, right? Whether you've articulated um, it, and again, the person doesn't need to be to be right. You can be wrong. That that doesn't bar recording the challenge. You can ultimately be wrong, but you do have to articulate, you know, your good ground, your grounds. And there is, the inspectors have some freedom to determine, like, did you articulate the right ground? It's like I don't live, you know, I don't live here. And and what's what's your basis? You know, what is your knowledge or your suspicion? Let me just ask one last time. I, I, the statute appears to require that all such challenges be reported. Where, 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 where can I find authorization for the secretary to put out an instruction with this preliminary step, sort of an answer, you know, preceding the statutory requirements? Well, if you look at 727 subsection 2, upon a challenge being made under subsection 1, and what are the requirements for making a challenge under subsection 1? Right. You know, it's it's there, right? You only get to 2 if you've met 1. Yeah, but that requires some type of merits determination before I, I you think, even decide. I mean, that, that's the problem, right? It's not a black and white question. It's not... It's not a merits determination, right? Because you can still be wrong. It's have you have you made have you cleared a threshold? Have you cleared the threshold of one to get to two? Have has the challenger or the registered elector articulated good, you know, their knowledge or their good reason to suspect why this voter doesn't meet some prong of what's required to be registered, right? I don't see that it goes to proof because you can always be wrong. And you might not have, I, I don't have to, you know, pull something out of my pocket to show that Mr. Smith lived down the street from me, right? My knowledge that he was my neighbor and he moved 12 months ago is my my ground, right? Is my good, my good the, cause. The, my the legislature cause. knew, they clearly knew of the potential for a challenger to make indiscriminate challenges or challenges without good cause because they talked about that in mm -hmm. subsection three. But the legislature didn't provide any language saying that what you're basically describing as frivolous challenges can be summarily dismissed well, without I think following the process that they went to such great lengths to lay out in this statute. Well, that, I think does, that, does that trouble I'm us? I'm sorry, Your Honor. Should that trouble us? 
I think if you look at the fact that they can't challenge indiscriminately and without good cause is why there's a threshold clearing, right? Right, Because the, the clerk needs to know, you know, we, we're not, we don't have to allow indiscriminate challenges, right? Because that's not prohibited. I mean, that's not permitted. So that's, that's why there is grounds to enforce this threshold, sort of but the it's threshold. Not, it's not, it's not, it's prohibited and it's made to be a misdemeanor. It doesn't say, it doesn't create this alternate pathway. That's, that's what I'm having difficulty with. You know, there, there might be some wisdom in not having an alternate pathway where right. someone makes a, a, a judgment right out of the gate that a challenge is, is impermissible or frivolous or whatever, or indiscriminate, whatever you want, however you want to describe it. And therefore, it's just made to disappear like it never existed. Maybe there's some wisdom in actually having the liaison check a box that says, here, here's the what was given to me, and this is an impermissible reason, and then someone else later could review that, and that would be transparent. What, I mean, what's wrong with that process? Well, I think going back to sort of the point about the indiscriminate challenge and it being a misdemeanor, I, I think we have always, the sec, you know, the secretary is is free to take action or clerks are free to take action to help prevent the, you know, the perpetration of misdemeanors, right? And so if we're looking at what challengers can't do, they can't they can't challenge indiscriminately. Um, they can't use the challenge process to harass or annoy voters. And you can't use it as a delay, ta you know, to delay, um, you know, the election officials in, in the process. I mean, we're taking into all of those factors in, to, into consideration in, in formulating and understanding, you know, when something will be a challenge, when have you made a good challenge? Right. And if you've only made a facial challenge, you don't get to, uh, you know, to the subsection two. But, you know, uh, if we're wrong, you know, if we're wrong uh, on this, you know, again, 727.1 and 2 uh, only apply to the two specific challenges at issue in one. Right. I agree. So I agree with you. we're wrong on the registered elector, which is an uh and then the you know, the challenger challenge in here for AV ballots. I mean that that just gets recorded, so um, so we don't have we're wrong on we're potentially wrong on registered electors. But I, there's I, no. I, I, no I apologize for burrowing in. It took me a little while to get warmed <laughs> up, so I had to. Sort of, That's okay. <laughs> out, but I appreciate your, your answer. Thank you, Ms. My guest. Um, and now we, we will turn to Mr. Avers. You have. Um, 10 minutes, and then um, you are sharing time with Ms. Howard, um, who has, has five minutes. So we will put 10 minutes on the, on the clock. Thank you. Good morning. Robert Avers on behalf of the Divisor plaintiffs, uh, which are Richard Divisor, the Michigan Republican Party, and the Republican National Committee. So <clears throat> um, listening to the discussion so far this morning, I have to say uh, a, a lot of the back and forth strikes me as um, the kind of discussion that would occur during the APA rulemaking process, right? Um, uh, what's good cause for a challenge? Um, you know, what if there is a threshold requirement for it to be recorded? Um, you know, what what sorts of factors go into whether whether that is uh, has been uh, satisfied or not, right? And I mean, largely the lower courts they treated this case as an APA case. I'd like to read just a brief quote from the Court of Claims decision. It's actually the first two sentences from that, uh, from the opinion. An executive branch department cannot do by instructional guidance what it must do by promulgated rule. This straightforward legal maxim does most of most of the work in resolving these two consolidated cases. The Court of Appeals actually went on to, to quote the same passage um, on page two of its decision. And then it said, not only do we agree with this observation, we also agree with the trial court's resolution on the issues now challenged on appeal. And so both of those courts, uh, both of the lower courts decisions, the legal maxims discussed by those courts, they're clear, they're uncontroversial. Um, when the secretary takes an action that is in the form of a rule as defined under the APA, then both the APA and the Michigan election law require compliance with the APA rulemaking process. And absent compliance with that process, the rules are invalid. That's exactly what happened here. It's black letter law under both the APA, the Michigan election law, and under this court's precedent. 
Um, so with that, I'm happy to take the court's questions. Thank you, uh, Justice Thara. Thank you, uh, Justice Thara. So uh, the, the so statute, does, statute does indicate that the uh, secretary can make rules, I'm sorry, instructions or promulgated rules. Can you help us understand the distinction and how we draw a line as to what is an instruction and what is a promulgated, what is a rule that needs to be promulgated? Sure, that would be any rule that fits the definition of a rule under the Administrative Procedure Act, which is MCL 24.207. And um, I mean, obviously there's exceptions to the rule. Um, I understand that the secretary has taken the position that um, some of her rules here fall within those exceptions. Um, but generally speaking, um, you know, simply put, any agency standard or policy or instruction of general applicability that implements or applies the law enforced by the administrative agency is a rule. And, you know, I, I hear the Secretary's Council talk about how their instructions are, quote, tethered to the Michigan election law. That sounds to me a lot like standards or policies that are implementing a law that's administered that's administered by an agency. So if we so agree, if, agree with, if we agree with you on the first um, your opening state your opening statement, the, the the first two sentences from the Court of Claims, and then as adopted and expanded and expounded upon in the Court of Appeals. Uh, is there any work for us to be done as to whether uh, there's violations of law on some of these instructions or rules? Or do we just send it and say you have to you have to go back and do a rulemaking? So, of course, an agency can't promulgate a rule that conflicts with law, right? I mean, the rules have to yield to to laws that are enacted by the legislature. So, it would be the divisor plaintiff's position that um, all of these rules here, you know, even if the secretary went back and promulgated them under the APA, they conflict with the Michigan election law. So um, those rules, even if promulgated, they they would be fatally flawed in that regard. So, so what remedy are you seeking here? A declaration that these are all invalid, or That's we say no, these are. These are in the form of rules. Go back and promulgate your rules. Do a public hearing. Maybe maybe they look differently afterwards. And then if they still look like they're violations of law, is that something that can come back? So the remedies that we saw at the Court of Claims were both, right? We saw um, a declaration that these were rules. These were, these were both rules under the APA and they're invalid rules because they were not promulgated under the APA. And then separate from that, we also saw a, a judicial declaration that um, each of these rules uh, are invalid because they are inconsistent with the Michigan election law. Now, I would say that a lot of this sort of back and forth as to whether the, the these rules violate the Michigan election law or are inconsistent with the Mich Michigan election law, they could have been worked out through the administrative um, rulemaking process. And in fact, we just saw that in the signature, the absentee ballot signature verification rules that were promulgated by the secretary over the last two years. Um, there were, you know, I, I don't want to use the word problems, but there was some disagreement with the Joint Committee on Administrative Rulemaking about the substance of some of those proposed rules. And, you know, that's known as JCAR. They pushed back on some of the substance and there were amendments that were that were made to the proposed rule set. All right, thank you. Justice Viviano? All right, thank you. I'm slow on the mouse today. Uh, Council, can you help us understand whether these uh, so-called instructions have uh, the force and effect of law? I uh, know you referenced 24.207. I guess I'm looking at subsection H now. Um, you know, I think I think one of the arguments made to the contrary was that it seemed to be that there was some discretion and whether to eject folks or whether to follow the instructions. And therefore, they don't have the force and effect of law. Could you respond to that? So just to make sure I understand the question, are you asking whether, uh, because it, it seems 
it seems as though there is an option as to whether a challenger can be thrown out, for example, if they make repeated impermissible challenges as to what if if it's a permissive standard, whether that makes it a rule. Is that the question? That's uh, part of the question. The, the overall question is just whether you think that what has been done here has the force and effect of law. I think each of these have the force and effect of law. I mean, if you look at the manual, I mean, the, the language here, excuse me just for a moment, but the language that's used to introduce um, these rules in, in, the, in the manual is your classic um, binding sort of language. Apologize. Um, sorry, one second here. Okay, so I mean, I'm at page 25 of the divisor plaintiff's answer to the application. Uh, we have a block quote here from from the manual, um, and I'm, I'll just read it. The publication is designed. This publication is designed to familiarize election challengers, poll watchers, election inspectors, and members of the public with the rights and duties of election challengers and poll watchers in Michigan. Election challengers and poll watchers play a constructive role in ensuring elections are conducted in an open, fair, and orderly manner by following these instructions. And then it goes on to say, challengers and poll watchers should familiarize themselves with these instructions and directions in this publication, governing their conduct, rights, and responsibilities. That doesn't strike me as permissive language. That strikes me as a set of rules that govern conduct by those covered by the manual. What about the, the fact that people can be ejected um, if they don't conform to these rules? Is that something we should be considering? I, yeah, in, in the same stripe, yes. Yes, Justice Viviano. I mean, if, if, if essentially, if a, if a challenger uh, doesn't follow one of the rules in the manual, then the manual says that they can be thrown out. So again, that would be indicative of a rule rather than an instruction. All right, thank you, Counsel. Justice Bernstein. Uh, no questions at this time. Justice Kavanaugh. Uh, yeah, a couple follow up. I just, I, you're saying it's these these instructions have the force and effect of law, and you read us, you know, some from the manual. If those instructions are consistent with the statutory text, is it the instruction that has the force and effect of law, or is it the law that those instructions that are consistent with that law, it's the, the statute that has the force and effect of law, not an instruction that is merely adhering to the text of the statute, right? I understand your position well, saying that they're that here these ones you've challenged are not sufficiently tied or consistent with the statute. But if we were to disagree with you and say I think that they are sufficiently tied to the statute and our and our uh you know an instruction properly an instruction then it's not the fact that the manual says you have to follow them it's not because it's an instruction that gives it the effect of law. It's because the statute upon which they're based is the law, right? So when I'm answering Justice Viviano's question and I'm reading the the passage from the manual, what I'm what I'm getting at there is the definition of a rule under MCL two four point two zero seven. It includes it includes language that says. Um, it has to be an agency regulation statement, standard policy ruling, or instruction of general applicability. And what I'm getting at there is that that language um, that goes to the general ap applicability piece of the rule, the the definition of a rule. And so, if these, you know, if 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 these are not rules and they're truly instructions that um, are consistent with, you know, they they're they're firmly tethered and consistent with the Michigan election law, then I would agree with your position. You know, in, in here, you know, we my clients did not ask to rescind the entire manual, right? I mean, I think the manual is 27 or 29 pages long and they, they only sought to challenge a handful of the provisions that are in the manual. And it was, um, they, they were provisions that um, we felt 
were rules under the APA and at the same time also happened to be inconsistent with the Michigan election law. So I, I think I answered your question. Okay. Um, I want to jump to 727. So, so do you, so the fact that 727 two says upon a challenge being made under subsection one, that is the trigger, if you will, of, of a recording requirement, right? And subsection one, um, I mean, it says that they know or have good reason to to suspect that the applicant is not a qualified and registered election or elector of the precinct um, or the the name in the book. Um, so doesn't the fact that two says you have to determine it, like only those that qualify under sub one, doesn't that, I mean, we may have disputes of how far they can go, but at a minimum they have, doesn't an, uh, doesn't an election inspector by statute have to determine whether or not it's in fact a challenge that meets the requirements of one, which is the knows or has good reason to know. So there is some discretion, right? Like they have to determine at some level that in fact it's a one, right? That it's it's a it's a a challenge to the the whether or not they're a qualified elector in the precinct. If, if that inquiry requires making a thumbs up or thumbs down call as to whether the challenger has good reason to suspect, then I would say no, because I don't think you can make that determination without adjudicating the challenge in the first place. Well, well what do you do with your with Miss Mindgast's example of saying? Somebody who says Mr. Smith is not an elector in this precinct because I'm his neighbor and, you know, I know I, I believe he moved 12 months ago. That's enough to get to two and have to record it. He can be wrong, but making that that determination. So so the fact that but he has to say that that part, right? Like otherwise. The, the, I don't think he lives here because he's my neighbor and I think he moved 12 months ago. That's, that's what brings you into sub one, right? So just saying, I don't think he's a qualified, would you agree that just saying, I don't think he's a qualified elector does, is insufficient to bring you under 727 sub one? The way it, the way it ought to be handled is under the law, they should adjudicate the challenge. And if, Upon adjudicating the challenge, they find out that this per the, that the challenger or um, you know wh whoever it is that's lodging the challenge under seven twenty seven one, if they don't have good reason to believe beyond you know I, I can't remember exactly what your hypothetical what if was, they don't but, give a saying, but if it, they essentially don't give saying, a reason, do they do they even are we even in the realm of sub one? They, yeah, they well, so, don't think he's an elector. So the way. The way that it should be handled is they should adjudicate the challenge and then educate the challenger. Say, listen, if that's I, I all that you like practice wise, I'm just going off of the text. The text says you only record under one. One says, here's the basis. You're not a qualified elector. And only if the the challenger says knows or has good reason to suspect. So if you haven't met those parts, you're not even under sub one. Right. There so, is a reporting requirement. I, I understand what I understand what the question and I understand the you know, good reason is awful gray. Right. And so, you know, perhaps under the hypothetical that you've raised, which is just saying they're not registered in this precinct with nothing more. Right. And with with the inspector asking, how do you know that or what is your reason? And if the challenger shrugs their shoulders and says, I don't know then that would not be good reason, right? But I mean, there, boy, is there an ocean of, of possibilities <laughs> that, that lie within good reason, right? I mean, if, if I say, well, I've lived in this precinct for three years and I go for a walk every day and I've never seen this person before, is that good reason? No, I agree, but isn't, doesn't the manual only say you have to require this, right? Like, I mean, it is an ocean, and there are also, I mean, we could stay here all day and talk about different hypotheticals, right? The instruction is trying to say to 
how people in the polling place are supposed to handle those situations. Like they're the ones in the sea of the gray, right? So doesn't the instruction just say, look at the statute requires eligibility and knowledge or good reason. So that's what's required, right? Now, whether or not that's true, whether or not it's good reason, whether or not he made that up or whether whatever, it's recorded, it gets resolved, it might, it might carry the day, it might fail, whatever. But whether or not it's even one that needs to go to that determination of merit is the question that we're dealing with, right? Whether or not the instructions adequately put the, put that statutory language into practice. So I, I guess I, I might have lost track of your question. Well, I was to say, I mean, I mean, do you agree that like that that we're in the realm of an, ele an election inspector having to make some kind of determination? of whether or not the statutory criteria are met. And the manual says you have to give the four reasons and you have to give, you know, give the knowledge or good reason of why you believe that. Four criteria and give knowledge or or that. I understand there's a there's a second question or a, a third level sort of that I I asked Ms. my guest about which was arguably like it is is can an election inspector be making sort of a merits determination right where they think it has it's objectively i forget what the language is it's objectively not um it's obviously inapplicable or incorrect right that sounds to me like maybe we're getting into more of a merits or a proof sort of requirement which may go too far but at least given one of the four reasons and requiring the challenger to state their knowledge or good reason for believing that is, is just saying what the statute requires, right? No, subsection two actually doesn't say that. Subsection two says upon a challenge being made under, sub, under subsection one. It doesn't say upon a challenge um, upon a challenge being made based on good faith or good reason to suspect or anything like that. So I don't. Isn't that I, I what actually one requires? I, I just I disagree with that. I if okay. if a challenge is made under subsection one, it needs to be recorded under subsection two. It doesn't need to be, I mean, obviously we're not saying that all of those challenges need to be sustained, but it needs to be adjudicated. Okay. Justice Welch. So just continuing on uh the hypotheticals that Justice Kavanaugh started. Um so what if um the reasons given are not um, sort of under the manual, not valid reasons for a challenge, but other reasons, as you said, the universe could be large. What if um, a challenger uh, does repeated challenges like that, that are not, um, and maybe they even get adjudicated, uh, but um, they're not like valid reasons for challenging an elector. They get recorded, all of that. At some point, uh, can that person be ejected? Or is this just does this is this permitted to go on all day long? Well, I mean, I, I certainly hope it wouldn't go on all day long. I mean, I think, you know, communication among inspectors and challengers could, could go a long way. Um, I mean, I'll say this. Interfering with an election worker is a misdemeanor under MCL 168.931B. And harassing or delaying voters is also a crime under MCL 168.7273. So do the so, police have to get called then or how what happens then? Let's assume that the the inspectors decide this person's clearly just holding up the line. It's the fifth fifth subjection without really a valid basis. Uh, and each elector has to come out of line, maybe talk to a designated person. Uh, mm -hmm. So um, and it, you know, it takes a lot of time when you pull people out of line and it takes 30 minutes or an hour to get it figured out. And then they can maybe go vote if that keeps happening at, at do the do they call the police or can they say this is enough? This is you're you're disrupting the order of the the um, polling place, which, of course, is under the secretary of state's purview. So practically speaking, there would be an escalation. Right. I mean, I believe um, you would explain to the challenger how the process works. I would hope that they already would know. And if they're one of ours, I certainly think that they would already know how this works. Right. But um, I think you have to educate the challenger a little bit. And if that's not enough, then perhaps the chair, the, the chairperson gets involved. 
Um, and then ultimately, I think you do have to contact law enforcement. But I, I again, I, I want to reiterate, this is a perfect conversation for the rulemaking process under the APA. This is exactly where that, I mean, this, this is a perfect example of the kind of give and take that um, is envisioned under, under the APA. Okay, so I, I would like to just turn to uh, the issue of um, the removal of a challenger from the precinct, um, sort of the ejection, so to speak. Uh, it, what I know, you know, there's this argument about the statute about disorderly or drunken conduct or, you know, drunkenness or disorderly conduct. Are, is that, I guess I'm wondering, is somebody who is sort of holding up a line and making challenges that are deemed invalid over and over, is that disorderly conduct? Uh, that's a good question. I, I mean, I, again, I <laughs> like I here. There's this great tension, right? I mean, challengers have rights too. They have a statutory right to be there. Sure. Under um, you know several several statutes in the Michigan election law, voters have the right to free uh, to to vote without you know being interfered with. Um, you know, election workers have to do their jobs, and there's criminal penalties if you if you interfere with that and if you get in get in the way with it. So. Um, you know, it certainly seems to me that um, there's some some space between all of these rights and these duties, right? Um, I would say I'm, I'm sure there's a there's a sea of case law on disorderly conduct, and you know when is it disorderly and when isn't when isn't it? I'm sure it's uh, highly fact specific, and uh, I'm confident that you know we could apply those factors to if if a challenger is really acting out um to that extent i i'm i'm confident that the legal system has the the sufficient tools to deal with that okay i have nothing more right now Thanks. i have nothing more justice bolden no questions um okay i just have one follow-up to what justice kavanaugh was asking and i, I just want to be clear on this so if a, if a challenger says, I, I, I challenge that this person is, uh, that, that they're not registered here and gives, says nothing else, that that does not get recorded. They have to, they have to indicate some reason of why they're challenging. I, whether, whether it's right or wrong, but they have to, they have to state some reason. Would you agree with that? I would not. Okay. And you, I, I, you think like, that you think that I mean, just hear me out for a second. So you could have a challenger that that every other voter that that comes forward, they can say, I, you know, I, I challenge this. I do not think that they're that they're registered to, to vote here. And they say nothing further. Each one of those gets recorded and adjudicated. Well, so you change the fact pattern a little bit. So let's just let's let's take the first the first hypothetical first. Right. Which was. Um, I, you know, I think your question was if if a, if a challenge is raised uh, and they just say this person's not registered in this precinct, right? I mean, I think that was mm -hmm. the, the question that you asked. To me, when you adjudicate the challenge, you're going to get more information from the challenger. But Why my, do you believe? But, what do you but believe my question, How do you know that? Right. That wasn't my question. My question was when when that when those words are said, I do not believe that they're that they're registered here that's enough for it to move on at that point and to go through the process. That's Correct. your position. Okay. Yes. Now, yes. Same I, I mean, that's what the law says. That's what, that's what, that's what the law says. Same, same, same language as being by the calendar and they're doing it with every other voter that comes in same language. So Mr. Smith comes in and they challenge Mrs. Smith. They say nothing. And Mr. Johnson comes in, same challenge. And and it's it's every other voter. All of those go through the process. They all get recorded and they go through the process. I I, I appreciate where you're going and I appreciate where you're coming from. And again, at some at some level, the inspector has to communicate to the challenger. And they have to, they have they have there has to be this collaboration between the inspector and the challenger. Hey, this is how this this is how this process works. 
Um, you know, you can only challenge for these reasons. You need to have good reason and, you, and you're not giving me any more reason. In fact, you're making all of these people, you're delaying all the, you're delaying the process for all of these people. So I either need you to um, give better, get, get, give a more articulate reason or don't make a challenge until you can, right? I mean, to my mind, practically speaking, that's how the system would work. I believe that that would be consistent with the Michigan election law. And it would probably also um, uh, operate such that the inspectors wouldn't have to call law enforcement, which I think Thank is a, a good thing. Thank you. Uh, any any follow-up questions? Any, any questions? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Avers. Uh, Ms. Howard. Good morning, Justices of the Court. Anne Howard, attorney for the O'Halloran plaintiffs. I'm honored to address your questions this morning. Your first question addressed whether the challenge provisions of the manual are consistent with Michigan election law. Our response is no, the challenge provisions are not consistent with the law. Our brief describes in detail how defendants' instructions are inconsistent with the law. During oral arguments in the Court of Appeals, Judge Borello described how the Secretary's success or failure rises and falls on whether or not Michigan Election Law Section 31 provides the, Secretary, provides the Secretary of State with expansive permissive statutory authority. From the beginning of this case, defendants have argued that Section 31 does grant them expressive expansive authority. The Secretary's most recent Supreme Court filing boldly admonished the judges of the lower court for their failure to fully appreciate the expansive authority that she claims to possess. Ms. Howard, I'm, I'm sorry for interrupting, but because you have such limited time, I want to see if the if the justices have questions for you. Um, uh, Justice Viviano, start with you. I have no questions at this point. Thanks. Justice Bernstein? No questions at this point, but maybe at the end. Justice Kavanaugh. No questions. Justice Welch. Same, no questions. Justice Bolden. No questions. Justice Zara. None right now. Okay. You, you may uh, continue and I'll ask at the end of your time if anyone has, or an, anyone speak up if you have questions as Ms. Howard is, is speaking. Thank you. And I, I, I'm only, I only have another minute here. During our oral arguments in the Court of Appeals, Judge Borello described how this oh, okay. uh, rises and falls on whether or not Michigan election law section 31 provides a Secretary of State with expansive statutory authority. From the beginning of this case, defendants have argued that section 31 does grant them expansive authority. The Secretary's most recent Supreme Court filing boldly admonished the judges of the lower courts for their failure to fully appreciate the expansive authority that she claims to possess. Defendants were confident that their general authority claims are rooted in section 31 1A amendments enacted in 1999. They are misrepresenting the intent of our legislature. I invite the court to review the actual statute text amendments and the legislative agency bill analysis reports. These documents suggest the exact opposite of defendants claims. I can provide them to you for your review. The arguments we've provided clearly demonstrate that the challenge instructions are in conflict with the Michigan election law, which is a subset of the laws of this state. The key point is contained in the concluding clause of section 31, which reads, in accordance with the laws of this state. This is a plain text statement of constraint and not of expansion and negates defendants expansive authority argument. Defendant's argument for broad authority under, under 311A is simply fiction. With respect to the court's second question, even if authorized by statute, was the Secretary of State required to promulgate the challenge provisions as formal rules under the APA? Our response is that if the defendant had simply amended the remaining four contested provisions to comply with statutes, thereby enabling them, the controversy would end with no need to promulgate the instructions as rules. Thank you. Any follow-up questions? Yeah. Okay, seeing none. Um, Ms. Howard, I don't know if you have any, any final uh, words. You have a, a, a minute left. No, I don't. I, I just, I agree with everything Mr. Avers said as well. 
uh, thank you. Thank you all. Uh, the case will be submitted.